Hello, everyone, and welcome to Coast Talks for December 2023. Uh, this is our last Coast Talks for a very eventful 2023, and I'm glad you can join us today. Uh, my name is Jason Goldsworthy. I'm the Executive Director of Coast, and speaking to you today from Victoria, which is the territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, today known as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations. Uh, for those of you who are new to COAST, COAST is the Centre for Ocean Applied Sustainable Technologies, and we are Pacific Canada's hub for the blue economy. We're here to help industry find new commercial solutions to key challenges, supporting startups and new ventures to commercialise innovation, engaging with Indigenous leadership in ocean innovation, and attracting talent, capital and partnerships to grow businesses right here in British Columbia. On today's Coast Talks, we're talking about how AUVs and ROVs are revolutionising the technolo technological seascape. Over 80% of our ocean has not been mapped, explored or even seen by humans. As technology advances in autonomous underwater vehicles or AUVs and remotely operated vehicles or ROVs, a captivating journey into the world of underwater exploration, research and industry continues. In recent years, advanced robotic systems have been developing rapidly, opening up new possibilities and pushing the boundaries of what once was thought impossible. Today's panelists are here to discuss the bold ideas and emerging technologies driving advancements in AUV and ROV technology. We're very lucky to enjoy, uh, be joined by three people working in this industry. Uh, Eric Jackson, who's the president of Cellular Robotics, Braden Ray, the Director of Strategic Technical Sales and Training with Seymour Marine, and Dirk Brusso, the Field Service Manager for Ocean Networks Canada. First up, we're going to hear a little bit about from Eric. Um, Eric is the founder and president of Cellular Robotics. Uh, Cellular Robotics is a subsea robotics engineering company focused on autonomous underwater vehicles. Eric is a robotics control systems engineer with over 40 years experience, primarily in subsea applications. He was the lead engineer on early AUV systems built by International Submarine Engineering in the 1980s, then focused on autonomous robotic development for the Canadian Space Agency, also at International Submarine Engineering. This is all before founding Cellular Robotics in 2001, and for the last 20 odd years has been on a, a wonderful journey with Cellular as, as one of the leading companies in this space, and we're very privileged to have Eric here to talk a little bit about Cellular. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Jason. Uh, next slide, please. So there's numerous markets in the subsea world that are <clears throat> using or very interested in autonomous underwater vehicles. So there's marine telecoms, uh, marine energy, both uh, oil and gas and wind farms. With the wind farms, it's largely um, pre-construction surveys. And with the oil and gas, it's also pre-construction and asset integrity. There's interest in mapping polymetallic nodules in the deep ocean. Um, lots of climate applications, fisheries, marine data storage, government, and a big one these days is ocean security, uh, both in a commercial and defense aspect. Next slide, please. So at Cellular, we focus on two types of AUVs. So there's the cruising vehicles that look, uh, they're torpedo shaped vehicles. So starting in the upper left, the Solus Light is a small, <clears throat> it's not that small, it's one meter diameter uh, <clears throat> AUV. Uh, the Solus MR is a larger version with a battery pack and the Solus LR is a hydrogen powered vehicle system that um, is being sponsored by Defence R&D Canada. And then we have another vehicle in our shop right now called Solus XR, and that is also intended to be a hydrogen powered vehicle. It isn't yet, but it has removable payload modules, commercial and defence applications. Um, and uh, it's it just fits in a 40 foot container. Next slide, please. So why hydrogen? Um, so first of all, hydrogen is is has very ha, has the highest energy density by weight, and submersible vehicles tend to be made out of metal, and you need to add buoyancy for them. So you can argue that some other some other um, technologies will have uh, greater density by volume, but then you have to compensate that volume with um, flotation, whereas hydrogen and oxygen provide the flotation as well as the onboard power supply. 
<clears throat> and so some of the, like one of the markets that we're looking at is just displacing standard AUV operations where there's an offshore survey support vessel. And then if we can have vehicles such as Solus LR with a uh, thousand to 2000 kilometer range capabilities, then they can, they can completely displace these vehicles for many use cases. So there's a little blurb at the top. So 11 hydrogen AUVs will replace a megaton of marine carbon emissions over 10 years. Um, next slide, please. The other type of vehicles that we're working on are hovering AUVs. So the one on the left is the first one that we developed. And so that was uh, developed for confined space um, surveys and uh, asset integrity surveys. And that has a docking system as well. So the vehicle can actually dock and provide uh, recharge and provide um, payload um, data offload capability. Then one in the middle, a modus T is, uh, is also known as a tank bot. So that one's been developed for above ground storage tank inspection. So above ground storage tanks that are typically filled with um, petrochemicals, but also process water, and um, they need to be inspected for leaks, for, for corrosion uh, periodically. So you can either drain the whole tank out and put people in with hazmat suits or put a, a bespoke covering AUV inside to do the inspection. And the one on the right is another one that's been developed for ship hull um, acoustic and magnetic signature measurements. Next slide, please. So I just talked briefly about some of the main challenges with hovering AUV, sorry, with um, autonomous underwater vehicles. So first of all, <clears throat> remote commanding and situation awareness from these vehicles. So these vehicles are not like, these vehicles are designed to do things for humans. And so they work for humans and humans need to supervise them. That's, that's the idea. But we have no Wi-Fi capability, no internet. There's no electronic communications media at all for these vehicles. So you have to use very low bandwidth, lossy, uh, unreliable communication systems. So in order to optimize those communication channels, we need um, onboard intelligence on the vehicles and, and communications designed on basic information theory considerations. There's also a very interesting uh, human factors area called ecological human factors that talks about the ecology of the machines that we're actually controlling. Next slide, please. Or sorry, yeah. Navigation, so there's no GPS, there's no electromagnetic positioning systems. And the environments uh, may be known or unknown. So we need to uh, typically use very expensive and in some cases highly engineered navigation system so you can figure out where the vehicle is and vehicles can be navigated either in world coordinates so if you're doing a survey on the seafloor or in the coordinate system of an area that you are surveying for example inside a um, confined space or in a um, subsea um, an area with a bunch of subsea infrastructure next maneuvering and transiting um, Water weighs, a, uh, a me cubic meter of water weighs a ton. And so vehicles have to have the same weight as the water that they displace. So they tend to be fairly big and heavy and water has a lot of drag and just basic physics as power increases as the cube of velocity. So if you double the speed of a vehicle, you need eight times as much power. So you can really go through a lot of energy quickly uh, next. And then so onboard energy storage. Um, so the power requirements, as I just mentioned, especially with transiting and maneuvering can be very high. It can really go through a lot. It means you have to recharge. So if you're operating a autonomous underwater vehicle off of a vessel, they're typically recharged every day or every two days. Whereas if you can have a hydrogen solution, leave it in the water for a, a few weeks, and that's a big advantage. Next. And just autonomy. So autonomy 
one aspect of that is not needing a remote power supply and real-time supervision, not needing a surface ship to tag along directly above the AUV for recharging, position updates, and low bandwidth acoustic telemetry. And it also means making decisions on board based on sensors and synchronized models, um, ideally 3D environment models, so SLAM type technologies where you either have predefined 3D models or you're building them in real time. Next. And then specific sensors and payloads for the application that you're using the vehicles for. So there, there are many subsea mapping sensors. Um, there's some very, very good ones, but they're typically processed post-mission. So they're, there's not a lot of onboard data processing in real time. It is starting to happen. New sensor development. So there's new use cases coming up for vehicles which require new sensors. There's some really good innovations in some subsea electromagnetic systems and uh, say towing long acoustic arrays or making the whole vehicle an acoustic array. And another payload will be deploying smaller AUVs, ROVs, and listening stations from the larger AUVs. Next. So we have a suite of core technologies that we can use to develop these various vehicles. And this is one of our, our um, enablers that allows us to support this and develop this um, suite of products. So software, um, control libraries and algorithms, electrical components, electric actuators, and energy systems. And then we can build a, a new skin around a vehicle with these various technologies inside. Next. Yeah, so that's just a brief overview of, of what we're up to and the kind of challenges that we face. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. It was a great introduction to what's been a, a bit of a challenge or a bit of a pathway over the last 20 years. Um, I'm going to come back. I've, I've made a couple of notes, uh, some questions. Um, you sort of answered a lot of mine on the challenges one, but I'll, I'll come back and hit you with that at the end of the session. Uh, okay. And I encourage uh, any of the audience as well, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat. We'll come back at the end uh, after each of our speakers has had a chance to chat, uh, and then we'll post some questions. So thanks, Eric. Uh, next up is Braden Ray. Braden is the Director of Strategic Technical Sales at Seymour Marine, based uh, on Vancouver, another company based in British Columbia in, in Nanaimo. Um, so Braden leads a team specializing in cutting edge underwater robotics uh, solutions and is dedicated to propelling the innovation in the industry. And to tell you, here to tell you a little bit about Seymour's role and, and where they're going. Um, thanks, Braden. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jason. I really uh, appreciate you having me. Um, a little bit about Seymour Marine. We were founded in 2006 in Nanaimo and have stayed there ever since, um, manufacturing our ROVs right on the island. Um, we have a wide array of applications for ROVs in, in, you know, across the world, really, from, you know, search and recovery missions to um, confined space in inspections, sea surveys. Um, there's a, quite a, a wide variety that we that we service currently. Um, and looking into the future of ROVs and, and where we really see the, the ROV market going is, is certainly focused on, on providing you know, autonomy to our customers as we see that's a, a, a growing trend in the industry. Um, from a product perspective, currently we offer three different models of ROVs from a two-man portable set, being able to deploy rapidly um, to a um, a large open bay ROV for, for large payload capacities. Um, really, we focus on being the as high level of a payload delivery system as we can be. So whether we're using um, high-end sonars or stereo cameras, um, different survey equipment, really we're focused on integrating that equipment um, to provide the best job possible to your clients with these ROVs. Um, you know, looking looking forward to what we're what we're coming with in the next few months, we're we're focused on uh, building um, building autonomy into our vehicles, like I mentioned before, with um, different sensors like USBLs, and DBLs, to be able to build a full picture to deploy rapidly and autonomously. Um, 
but that's about it for my, my quick spiel here. Um, Jason, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Um, again, I'm looking forward to hearing any questions that people have um, going forward. Thanks, Braden. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll come back to you later on with a few for a few questions. But thank you for for sharing a little bit about Seymour. Um, next up, we're going to do a bit of a change of tune now. So we've heard from Eric and Braden, who are in the uh, space of developing this technology and and selling and marketing it. I'm now going to hand it over to Dirk Brusso, who is the director of Observatory Physical Operations at Ocean Networks Canada. Um, and Ocean Networks Canada is a big user of some of this technology. So Dirk is primarily responsible for marine operations, which includes maintenance of ONC subsea cabled observatories and the design and installation of new infrastructure. ONC subsea infrastructure consists of hundreds of kilometres of subsea cables that provide power and communications to serve various scientific instrumentation. So from the end user perspective, uh, Dirk is here to talk a little bit about the use of AUVs and, and other sorts of similar technology. Handing it to you, Dirk. Hello. Yeah, thank you. I'm Dirk. I'm with uh, Ocean Networks Canada, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do. We operate cabled observatories, and we have them off the west coast of Canada. We have them on the east coast. We have them in the Arctic. And basically, it's providing power and communication to the seafloor. Uh, and this allows us to do all kinds of things, mostly science experiments or projects, but also, you know, it allows opportunity for industry to get involved as well. So. I'll walk you a little bit through some of the how we use ROVs and how we use a, AUVs as well. So in the next slide, please. So this is just an example of one of our observatories. This is the Neptune Observatory, if you're not familiar. It runs out of Port Alberni. It's 800 kilometers of cable, and it's um, 10,000 volts and fiber optics. And along that cable, that scientifically significant sites, such as the hydrothermal vents, the Endeavor Ridge, um, Barkley Canyon, Boulder Pinnacle, um, we have these breakout stations called nodes, and that allows us to um, interact with that cable. So normally what that means is taking a physical plug, a wet mateable plug, sending an ROV down, making that connection, and now you've got a live instrument or a live ROV, whatever you want to do that's connected to the internet and has power. Okay, next slide. Uh, here's just one little closer to home. It just runs right out of Vancouver, and it's our um, Strait of Georgia observatory called Venus. But same thing, you can see little squares in the middle there. That's, um, again, nodes or access points into this backbone fiber optic power cable. Okay, next slide. So here's just a quick example of what we traditionally use. This is a um, science class RV. I think this one's 25 horsepower, and it is currently attached to a 2,000 pound instrument platform. So you can see the orange oily hanging off of that instrument platform on the side. And we'll use the ship and ROV to go place this platform near a cable connection. So within a couple of meters, ROV will unlatch and then um, actually go to pull that cable out and plug it into the backbone cable. And this would be anywhere from, you know, um, in 50 meters of water to 3000 meters of water that will do this. Okay, next one. So our observatories are not just offshore, they're also coastal. We have eight coastal observatories and they're uh, normally much smaller. So we get to use small vessels, uh, little davits and small ROVs. We'll use the davit to deploy something on the seafloor, acoustic release. And then the ROV would go do inspections and we use them mostly for recovery of infrastructure if we have to clip into something, but um, doing cable surveys uh, and uh, getting um, instrument orientations, things like that once they're on the bottom. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, this is just another option that we use sometimes, and that's when you just need an eye in the water. You don't need to interact. You don't need to, any kind of manipulator, but you just want to go and check something out. Okay, next one. All right, here's an example of a larger science class ROV, and this is the back in the background. You can see, for instance, a connector panel. This is in two and a half kilometers of water, 250 kilometers offshore. And uh, it's currently plugging that instrument platform you saw in the previous picture into the node. So this cable is coming from a node and it's plugging this IP into that. And on this, there'll be an array of different kinds of scientific experiments. Okay, so here um, we're using an ROV to do um, photogrammetry of a hydrothermal vent um, seamount. 
So this would be, it's still connected to the ship. Um, through this backbone cable, you take thousands of pictures as you're moving up and down this um, high thermal vent. And you then later in post, you can stitch it together and get like a very well, a like very accurate representation of that seamount. And then you can come back years later and do it again and see how that's changed and why those changes might've happened. Okay, next one. Uh, again, just the top of that particular seamount. Here we have, you can see the vent fluid off the top. You can see biology in the bottom corner. And we would use these science class RVs to then sample either biology or vent plumes. And kind of like what Braden was saying, it's just, these are just good platforms for incorporating different payloads. So whether you're doing suction sampling, using the manipulators, using Niskin samples, whatever scientists or whatever the newest and greatest technology is for science, you can incorporate them into these ROVs. And this is kind of an area that we would study using that. Okay, next slide. Again, here's an ROV. You've got a seven function manipulator on the side, a five function on the right. And we're busy ferrying a, um, a seismometer inside a caisson. So again, this particular site, 2,700 meters deep, you suction out a hole in the ground, put a seismometer in there, and then the ROV is controlled from the ship. Um, busy, it would place it, bury it, and then go and connect it back into the backbone cable. Okay, and it's not just all um, ROVs controlled from ships. We also have what we call Wally, -E, which is a rover ROV, and you can tell it's got the cable up top. So we'll use one of those science class ROVs, get this down on the seabed near infrastructure. We'll take that um, floating tether, plug it into a um, existing instrument platform, and then Wally's -E deployed for an, as long till it breaks eventually, which is normally a couple of years, but. And it is just ran autonomously or remotely from shore. So anywhere with the internet connection can send Wally -E around to take samples of whatever you might be interested in. In this particular case, we had him on um, uh, methane seeps and he will be a kilometer down taking methane samples and doing getting video. And yeah, that's what we're using Wally -E for. We've got a future project for Wally, -E, but that's different, not methane. All right. Next slide. Um, so we don't just use ROVs, we also use ASVs, which is not AUVs, but they're just surface vehicles, autonomous surface vehicles. And how we use that technology in this particular geodesy um, uh, project is we use them for tracking um, seafloor plate movements. So we'll have, you can see these little crosses on the screen. They're all clusters of uh, transponders on the seafloor. And the advantage of an, um, autonomous surface vehicle, you send it in, you send it out from shore, it goes on a six, seven week long mission or so up to two months where it just figure eight slowly over top of these transponders and using its GPS coordinates and getting an average of this, these um, transponders on the seafloor, it can detect that to sub centimeter accuracy where they are. And then if you do that annually, which is what we're doing, then you can track how those transponder clusters are kind of moving independent of um, or independent of each other, right? So you can see how that plate is moving. Anyways, yeah, so next picture. This is uh, just a picture of that surface vehicle. It's a two-bodied system. Those fins down below um, use wave energy as the, as the um, ASV moves um, up and down with the waves. It's actually propelled by waves. So it has essentially an indefinite um, deployment time, which is a huge advantage for us for getting these long averaging um, data sets. And then final slide is on the next one. In this case, we deployed it from a ship, but we've also done it from a small boat a few times. So yeah, send it on its way and then you collect it six weeks later. That's 200 kilometers offshore that we dropped it. And then we'll pick it up in Banfield six weeks later. And that's it. Thanks, Dirk. Sounds <clears throat> pretty amazing. Uh, interesting job you got there. That's cool. <laughs> um, uh, thanks to the panelists for the bit of an introduction. Um, I would like everyone to put their cameras back on now. And the, the hard part of the afternoon comes, or the morning, I should say, and that is for me to pose some questions. So thanks, Dirk. Thanks, Eric. And thanks, Braden. Um, so I got a number of questions, um, uh, but I'm hoping there might be a few questions from the audience too, and, and please put them into the questions and answer box, and I'll, I'll pose them to our, our panelists. Um, I want to 
start with Eric. Um, one of the questions I was preparing to ask was what are the biggest challenges? And you just knocked that one out for me and just listed them all. So thank you for that. Uh, um, I, I was doing that before I got your question. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. It's great minds think alike, right? Yeah. Um, Eric, uh, uh, you talked a lot about programming and autonomy and, and the mm -hmm. difficulties associated with that. I'm interested to know what level of autonomy do these vessels actually have at the moment, um, or is it mainly controlled by humans at a, at a remote location? Um, um, quite a few years ago, um, doing work with the Canadian Space Agency, we we came up with a um, like a an arch a hierarchy for autonomy, and so it's a it's not a it's not a uh, global hierarchy. It's just a way of approaching the problem. So we have a bunch of like, levels of autonomy and they're really, you can think of the levels of automation. So the very lowest level is just the actuators can position a, position themselves. And the next level is that the vehicle can go and do like auto heading, auto depth, et cetera. Then the next level above that is the vehicle can do automatic line following or targeting and go to going to a point. Then the level above that, or or when you start to stitch those things together and then make decisions about what you're going to do based on the environment. And there's obstacle avoidances in there as well. And then higher level things are the idea is that the higher level, the higher level commands, if you like, can use all of the lower level commands to do the things that it needs to do. So um, we have like generic things like lawnmower patterns. So the vehicle can fly a, we call it a lawnmower pattern where it just goes and does a survey or uh, it can do a figure eight or it can do a specific like sensor calibration pattern and so forth. And then what we're working on is, is increasing going a level above that to say that like parameterize all of those things and um, be able to initiate them and then uh, exit out of them and, and do something else. So we've been, you we always start by bottom up and building the capabilities so we can go it out and do sea trials. And then we're, we're continuing to improve all of those levels of autonomy. Um, one thing that's very important, I mentioned it as a challenge is the ability to interpret sensor data on board in real time. And that is, um, it's always a, an issue. Like the new sensors like uh, synthetic aperture sonars can just generate huge amounts of data in, in real time. And then it, um, it's just some metrics I've heard as well. There's gonna be like eight hours of processing for every hour of survey time, like post-processing back home with all the computer banks. So being able to do things like that on board or, or something that is of great interest. So do you see that that the push towards more autonomous will will occur, obviously, with increased ability to, you know, yes. set, process that data and get to that point where it will be able to make decisions itself? Yeah, so it, we, it does, they do that. They do make decisions themselves, but they're at limited levels of capability. Um, so autonomy is 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 a super interesting field, and it's something I've been working with most of my career. And um, it's it's impacted by the complexity or the or the bandwidth of the problem that you're trying to solve. So if something's happening really fast and is really complex, like autonomously driving a car through through traffic and pedestrians and everything. That's a that's a very complex problem. Whereas if you're if you're just wanting to survey, like just do a lawnmower survey in the ocean, then that's it's nowhere near as difficult. But if you're trying to do a lawnmower survey in the ocean and then say, um, well, look at the data that you've got, and if you see something interesting, then go back. And so that's these are the the bigger challenges to try and actually do that. And the other thing that we don't have, as I mentioned, in an autonomous, sorry, in a in a um, self-driven automobile has access to the internet at all times and the cloud. We don't we don't have that. And um, the ability to go back and like send a signal that over a low bandwidth, high latency, lossy link 
to a to a supervisor saying, this is what I saw, what do you want me to do? So that's another super interesting challenge. Okay, um, Braden, you talked about, uh, with Seymour about looking, working with your clients, working on what your customers are needing and, and working from there. What are you seeing of the future applications for AUVs moving forward in terms of what your customers are asking for and, and where Seymour is thinking of if heading in the direction? Yeah, so in terms of ROVs, I think the direction that the the industry is heading is, you know, to be able to do those lawnmower power patterns that, that Eric has talked about and focus on the inspection itself and letting the robot you know, take care of the flying and the and the positioning itself. Now that that problem becomes more complex, like Eric was saying, when you're not in an open ocean and you're in a confined space, and a lot of it relies on acoustic sensors, which don't do very well in confined spaces. Um, so solving that problem with an internal IMS system that can handle all of that um, without the need for acoustics is that is something that we're, we're working on moving forward. Um, a big application right now for um, is in the search and recovery field, being able to, those lawnmower patterns are really important to be able to help find uh, and bring home drowning victims. Um, <laughs> as well as, you know, your basic inspection work, being able to, to, to do it at different depths and different, uh, different longs and lats. Yeah, so something that really hadn't thought about the search and rescue component, which you know is rapidly deployable, makes sense in in what you're talking about. So that's an interesting application. Absolutely. Um, Dirk, I was thinking as you were showing some of the images that Ocean Networks Canada have done, and and uh, I, I'd hesitate to guess that you probably couldn't have done what you've done or what ONC has achieved without the uses of of this technology. But what's kind of been the biggest advantage for Ocean Networks Canada with using these sorts of uh, these sorts of opportunities or technologies? Oh, sorry, Dirk, I think you're on mute. You kind of mentioned it there. Um... Definitely, it would not be possible without the use of ROVs. Uh, alternatively, you're kind of stuck at that. For us, you're kind of stuck at that diver level, right? Um, how deep can a person dive? And that's essentially your limit for being able to do things like this. Um, on the near coastal side, for sure, like advancement in ROVs, it's just more people have them. They're more accessible. They're more deployable as well. So, um, in the past, like when I started, even eight years ago, they there weren't a lot of options for ROVs and not a lot of people had them. So if you wanted to go north coast of the Arctic or you want to do a survey, um, yeah, it was very challenging. But now it seems like they're commonplace. A lot of organizations have them, especially anyone that's using the Marine sub, pretty much can go anywhere and there are, there's an ROV that you could use or you can even bring your own little guy like I showed that little um, portable eye of ours. If in, in an absolute pinch, that's what you got to do and you can fly with it, right? So that's kind of, um, yeah, but in terms of offshore, uh, yeah, the ultimate advantage is the ROV. So without without having it, you couldn't do any of this. Um, you uh, you saw those platforms, the ROVs with the seven function farms, being able to plug, make connections or interact from the ship to a very specific like platform and making those connections. Like I don't know, those are the the control and the ability to do those fine finesse movements. That's the advantage. I mean, I don't know. There's just no that's there's no other way to do it right so yeah uh, that's what we found with the current technology that we're using fantastic um we actually do have uh, a question from the audience from will um thank you for them their, their participation and it's actually a really good question on the hydrogen um component and uh, eric maybe you can fill this one seeing you brought it up um has there been much industry industrial use of hydrogen powered AUVs or is this still early in the development? This is still early in the development. Um, there, there have been, um, there have been R and D projects done in the past. Uh, U S Navy has done some, but they've, they tended to have gone to more of a moonshot thing. Like, well, we're not going to just use hydrogen. We're going to use liquid hydrogen. And so they give themselves a bunch more problems. So we're focused on trying to, trying to use uh, initially automotive type hydrogen technology. And now we're 
we're um, pivoting to more like spacecraft hydrogen fuel cells, ones that are um, like, that can that can breathe um, like pure oxygen. So, for example, the the more automotive type approaches is that you breathe just regular air. You provide hydrogen, and then it breathes air. But there's no air subsea, so we're 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 trying to fool the fuel cell into thinking that it's breathing air by trickling in um, by trickling in oxygen and keeping the nitrogen level and just trying to keep that. Meanwhile, it's in a super hot and highly very humid uh, environment, so they the fuel cells don't like that so much. They're they're still pretty uh, they're pretty good though, but we're going to a direct oxygen one. So there's a lot of interest in the user community. In the ocean, and so we we believe that that uh, this is going to be a, a big deal. I'll, I'll say one other thing is that there've been there's many types of fuel cells. Hydrogen is is like the most successful fuel cell and the most common one, and it it is going to make a huge difference in the world. But sometimes we'll say, well, we're using a fuel cell, and people say, oh, well, so and so tried that uh, 20 years ago and it didn't work. So what kind of a fuel cell was that? Oh, some kind of aluminum oxide thing, nasty byproducts, and this. Well, we're using automotive hydrogen technology. It it outputs pure water. So, um, I really we I really believe in it. And maybe just a, a quick follow up on that, then Eric. I mean, you talked a little bit about what the applications a little bit were, um, but I presume mm -hmm. once we perfect this hydrogen, and it's not a matter of if, it's when. Yeah, uh, it does change. The potential uses of AUVs and, and ROVs to be much longer, uh, you know, very much um, longer missions. You know, mm -hmm. what what are some of the like out there type of ideas about what the, they could be used for? There's a lot of interest, and in, we're actually being funded for just Arctic surveillance. So, how can you go under ice for weeks at a time? Um, but in the commercial world. Um, like following long, long pipelines, like doing pipeline uh, corrosion surveys without having to have a, a chase vessel over top of it that the vehicle has to come to the surface every day or two to get recharged. Um, another application that we're, that there's a lot of interest in is to be able to take a small, a small vehicle, like a, a Seymour vehicle say, and just, launch from port and then drive the vehicle 500 kilometers offshore to a subsea production, uh, oil and gas production um, unit and do asset integrity surveys on that with the, with the ROV maybe popping up a buoy or something or plugging into a, another, um, like a sea, a seafloor node. And uh, so there's, People are really coming up with a lot of ideas. And I'll have to say that um, before about 2015, like from my when I was working in the 80s through 90s, and then before about 2015, people were saying, oh, if I had a if I had an autonomous underwater vehicle, I'd put a cable on it so I wouldn't lose it. And then starting about 2015, people started saying, hey, you guys should have drones in the ocean. <laughs> so uh, there's just been a real tipping point in people's mindset so now they're just like oh we could do this we could do that oh, we could save. yeah it opens the possibilities doesn't it yeah save a lot of money uh, uh cut back on a lot of uh, carbon emissions um brain i'm gonna come to you now um i know seymour does um a lot of stuff uh, across the borders and international as well and you do a lot of outreach in that because uh, i've seen uh, work with you guys over the last little bit as well in terms of where the how canada the work canada's doing uh, mbc in particular we've got two fantastic companies cellular and yourselves here working in this space how does it compare with um, the rest of the world uh, in terms of the technology development and, and where are we leading and where are we potentially uh, following? Yeah, so I, I really do think Canada is leading in the in the ROV AUV space right now. There's there's two of the largest companies in the world producing, you know, unmanned ROVs in, in Canada. 
Um, obviously, the island has been a little bit of a hotbed for subsea robotics for and sensors for a long time. Um, you know, I really see that it's starting to be adopted more and more um, industrially by by companies where traditionally they would use you know divers or older methods. We're seeing that that there's really from a safety perspective, we're seeing ROVs being used more and more to avoid those risks. And I think that um, it's just going to continue that way as the technology becomes more user-friendly um, and the, the barrier to entry um, with the amount of ROVs on the market is, you know, dwindling and, and you can get into a, a small unit for, for not a, a ton of you know, capital expenditure, I think it's, you know, it's only, you're only going to see more drones in the ocean than in our waterways. Okay. Um, thank you, Dirk. I'm going to put you on the spot here. And uh, it was a question I sent out to everyone first, but you, I'm putting you on it. What, from your perspective, as, as a user of AUVs, would be your ultimate type AUV uh, in terms of autonomy, autonomy or functionality? What, from the from an end user, what what would be the perfect system for you? Yeah, you're on mute again, Dirk. Uh, nice. Um, so obviously, our industry is ocean science and exploration, right? Um, so from our perspective. And we're not the only ones doing it. There's a lot of people across the world doing cabled observatories. So it's not just us, but having an AUV that can interact with its surroundings would be would be pretty cool. Um, as a couple examples, I mentioned the photogrammetry there. An AUV that knows where, where it is and they can do those patterns and map a specific seamount, go back to something like a node, download that data, and then, okay, you've done that. You wanna do it next year again. In the meantime, you can use that same ROV with a sensor pack to do column profiles and take measurements of like plume samples or any of these kinds of things and just live at a site as opposed to us having to run, you know, 30 different cables and directions for each sensor and using one ROV. And really we struggle to get into the water column. It's, it's challenging. And I think an ROV, like an AUV that's kind of dual purpose, but can also do your column measurements would be really cool. Um, one thing ONC is working on in a cal collaboration is, um, we want to put in this neutrino telescope offshore, which right now we've done a few moorings and it's like optical sensors and it's strings. And uh, their next challenge to putting one, one kilometer mooring string in with 20 modules and their glass sphere modules or optical sensors. The ultimate goal is to have this telescope have a hundred strings, one kilometer moorings in a short mooring field in a small mooring field. And uh, that'll be 2000 sensors, right? So if you can think about an optical glass sensor and having to get a ship out there with an RV to clean each one every so often or something like that, but then having an AUV that's docked at the bottom that can know its surroundings, it's know the map, follow each morning string, whether it's like, you know, blasted with current with water or whatever, and just clean those sensors on someone just living out there in the ocean, cleaning sensors as it's going around, like that would be a really cool. And then of course, yeah, there's mapping and that kind of thing, but having something that's like Wally, -E, which was the deployed ROV, but having a deployed AUV that can do similar, similar things. That would be that would be the ultimate in my perspective. Perfect. Well, I'm going to start with Braden now, and then I'm going to go back to Eric on this one. So, Braden, what's stopping the development of the ultimate R A U um, R A U V? I guess. Um, what needs to happen? What where are the challenges? I mean, uh, Eric's talked about some of the challenges, but how how could the the ecosystem or the community get behind to, to develop that sort of technology? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, I think that it's as technology keeps getting smaller, we're going to be able to do more. Um, you know, finding finding the right partners for us is really important uh, as well. With you know, meeting with uh, trying to you know, find something that can have as much payload capacity as possible, but being in a, as small of a frame as possible, I think is the, you know, um, the ideal answer there. Um, being able to be portable and deployable off the side of a boat, um, I think that's, that's really important. Um, there's some cool technology coming out with unmanned surface vehicles and ROVs, much like Eric was describing with uh, the robot being able the AUV or the 
the AS me on being able to get to a certain point, deploy your ROV, it can do and then specs can come back up to the ASC and put, you know, collect that data automatically. So I think that's I think that's really exciting and I think that that's going to be a big future, especially in the ocean sciences and the offshore market, um, being able to see that happen with with ROVs. Perfect. Eric, you got anything to add to that? Is it uh, a matter of just throwing money at the problem or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's uh, certainly if we wait long enough, um, and just let uh, let the technologies evolve, then these things will be will be available in some number of years to be able to use. But you know, often you need somebody who uh, really just has a vision and some a budget and wants to push something forward. For example, with Defense R and D Canada with the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, with um, typically much of the innovations have been funded through the oil and gas community. So there have been, uh, so mostly subsea operating companies working with uh, oil majors, I would say that say, well, if we had this, then that would save a lot of money. And then, so therefore a bunch of investment goes into a company to build uh, to build something or to improve something to the point where that gets made, or just somebody's been in the industry long enough and says, "Well, I know what to do. I just need to raise a big pile of money and convince investors that we can do it." So that's, I, to me, it's it's really just making a business case is the, for such a, a device or for such a capability or saying how close can we get with other pieces that are available and then um, spend the extra money to be able to make it work for that specific bespoke application. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna change chins a little bit and, and Eric, you sort of opened the door on this one because you talked about you know the applications of, of one of your um, AUVs that's actually an above ground water tank. So completely out of the ocean industry. Um, and you just mentioned about oil and gas. So what other industries are um, sort of almost part of the development cycle of this? What sort of technology can be moved from other industries and across and, and, and what can this technology be used for other industries outside of the, the ocean sector? Um, maybe Eric, if you can maybe have a hit at that one first. Well, one, um, certainly the, the automotive industry provides um provides a direction in many ways. And they, some of the technologies are, are close to being uh, usable. Like in the automotive industry, hydrogen, of course, I've already mentioned, but also just the auto control systems and the, some of the, the standards that they use for, for the electronics talking to each other, because everything has to happen very fast in a car. And if you want to do like a higher speed autonomous underwater vehicle, you need to do high servo rates. So that's that's one that I can think of, um, but I'm sure I could come up with something better. <laughs> that's yeah, right. Ask, some, ask somebody else. <laughs> now, has anyone else got that? Any Brayden, Dirk, any thoughts on that one? I wonder if uh, maybe even like the drone industry, how that's kind of exploding and sensors coming off of that. I think it's probably you know more units are being built, more sensors are being like. People, more people are looking at that and then taking information from that and then try and incorporate that into maybe ROVs or, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. The um, the ability to to stitch camera images is something that's that's developed from the from the uh, portable, like the camera phone world and, um, and drones have, have really picked that up quite quickly. There's a... I there are a lot of problems in in being able to to transfer other uh, sensors into the ocean and manage depths and turbulence and et cetera, but or turbidity, not turbulence. But uh, yeah, you're you're not wrong. 
Okay, um, I've got another question um, from the audience, from Charles, um, and this is for each of you. So I'm going to start off with, say, Dirk to start with. Um, what what part of your work do you enjoy the most uh, in this sector? Oh, um, my favorite part as a user is let's say we use a um, ROV and you're going out on these expeditions and they're like, you know, three, four weeks long and you've got the teams, you've got the ROV techs, you've got the scientists, you've got everyone in like normally in a control van, which is like a two stitch together um, sea cans, 20 foot sea cans. And it's just screens all around. And you've got experts in any every field trying to put to the, you got your navigation system, your video, everything, everyone's there on mics and comms and it's broadcasted to shore. And uh, you're just like, all right, ROV, can you do that? And you just see everyone else go to work. It's like trying to make this thing happen. I mean, like that collaboration between everyone, that's my favorite part. Um, and then, yeah, it really takes a big, these big science class RVs. It's not just one person operating it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big team and it's maintenance when it comes up and it's, it's, I like that by that working environment. I like being around it. Everyone's excited about new science, new equipment, that kind of thing. So it's my favorite part as a user. Sounds pretty good. Braden, how about you? What's the, the favorite thing about you working with Seymour? Yeah, I think the collaboration, like Dirk mentioned, is, is one of my favorite parts. A lot of the times we're coming in very early in a project and kind of with an idea and a concept and really being able to help prove that out. Um, and and work with our end users to to really accomplish their goals and, and from a ROV manufacturer's perspective, you know, really being there to support it is is awesome and, and seeing the results, um, whether that's you know finding um, dumping structures or you know helping recover drowning victims. It's a very rewarding field to to be a part of. Um, and you're, you're helping explore the ocean and understand, you know, what exactly is going on beneath the waves, which I think is, is vital for our future um, as people living on this planet. All right. And lastly, Eric, you've, uh, you must enjoy it because you've yeah. been through a long journey. So <laughs> yeah. what's the best part for you? Yeah, I've never had a real job. So um, <laughs> but I think... Um, building the teams to design and build the vehicle systems. So putting the teams together and then the teams working hard because uh, they're very, it's very multidisciplinary um, effort. And then, and then taking the vehicles out on sea trials and like learning all the things that you never thought about, like the stuff you, you didn't know that you didn't know and addressing those things. And then, and then sending it out on real jobs with with some of our operators. We'll sending the we'll send the engineers out, and the engineers will say, "Who's the idiot who designed this?" And then, "Oh no, it was me." <laughs> and, and then uh, just bringing that back into the into the the designs of the systems. Yeah, it's very rewarding, and I I love uh, robotics and control systems. It's a autonomy. It's fascinating. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, um, as, as someone who's a bit of an engineering nerd, I just, I love this stuff. So <laughs> I, I get right into it. I wish I knew any more about it. Um, we're coming towards the end. Um, I thank you for your time. I just want to ask each of you as we, as we close out one last question. And, and we sort of touched a little bit on it with, with Dirk about um, post is about supporting the blue economy, about growing, you know, the opportunities here. And uh, it, it resonates with me that AUVs are a big part of that um, and they're going to be for the future. And I, I was going to just ask, uh, I'll start with Dirk again, about why AUVs are so important to the to the blue economy and, and the success of, of what the blue economy is trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it's, um, it's the more accessible the technology becomes, the more we can do, right? So as an example, what I talked about with that ASV, like, the cost of the ASV itself is cheaper than what you would have burned in fuel alone using a ship to do the exact same mission. So I think the benefit to the blue economy is like being able to do more with the same amount of resources in the long run. I think that's, that's where the biggest thing's coming from. Like, because six weeks of ship time trying to do just mapping transponders, that'll, that'll be insane for fuel. So. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Eric, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, the thing that's really fascinating about, or really interesting about uh, ROVs and AUVs in the ocean, and Dirk uh, mentioned this earlier, is that we're doing things that you can't do any other way. And it's not we're developing robots to put people out of jobs or to try and save a nickel on a production line. So we're trying to do things that you can't do otherwise. And um, and then and then we get to the to the savings and the, like the then the real cost savings by constant improvement and and increasing levels of automation, so less carbon production, etc. Bryden, anything to add to that, or is that pretty much covered it? That, that pretty much covers it. But yeah, the the benefit to the to the economy is really it, it's a cost-effective way of being able to to get real data um, quickly, and I think as we, you know, as we continue, this industry continues to grow, you're going to see that it's the safest and most cost-effective way to be able to to do inspections and get eyes underwater. Absolutely, and I think it's also. Um... I'm being parochial here, but you know it's pretty impressive that British Columbia and 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 this region is is really hitting above its weight on uh, uh, on developing this technology and supporting it, and that's exciting as well because I think there's we talked about energy energy systems, we talked about censoring, all of this different technology that has to be developed on these AUVs and ROVs that can have other uh, wider applications. Um, thank you. Dirk, Eric, and Braden. Uh, it was a great discussion. I uh, appreciate your time. I, I know everyone's very busy. Um, and uh, leading up to Christmas as well, lots of parties and all of that stuff. So, uh, but appreciate your time. Um, that's kind of bringing our webinar to a conclusion today. Um, so, please thank uh, Eric Jackson, President of Cellular Robotics. Braden Ray, Director of Strategic Technical Sales and Training at Seymour Marine, and Dirk Brasso from Field Service Manager at Ocean Networks Canada. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, as always, we'll be posting this to our website, this webinar. Uh, keep a, an eye out for future webinars and podcasts, and please go back in history and look at all of the other uh, webinars that we've had. Um, thank you to the panel today, and uh, I wish everyone a, a very Merry Christmas uh, for 2023 and look forward to reconvening this next year. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, 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 all.